I wish to uh, welcome you, and I'm very happy that uh, so many of you have traveled from so far to support this initiative about scientific freedom. People have come from as far as California, Brazil, India, Australia, New Zealand, and um, really it shouldn't be necessary to open an institute for scientific freedom. It's like having clean water. It should be a human right. But as we all know, we constantly have to fight for scientific freedom and freedom of speech because there are strong forces that try to counteract these rights all the time. I did a, um, a magazine story. I got a commission to do a magazine story on this. This was in 2011. Uh, magazine says, what do you want to write about? I said, I want to write about PSSD. And <clears throat> I said, but I've seen your magazine. You're not going to print it because the magazine is funded with a lot of uh, ads. And the guy goes, oh, no, no. We have a, a wall between publishing and editorial. We'll, we'll publish it. So I did the article, and he goes, we can't publish this. <laughs> uh, but you see, and, and by the way, I interviewed many, many people who went on these antidepressants, came off, and they did not get their sexual function back. But it's not just sexual function. They just didn't care about life so much. They say, oh, I see a beautiful rainbow. I don't care. I hear a great song. I don't care. Um, I see a beautiful woman or a, a beautiful man. I don't care. So there was this extraordinary sense of loss related to going on an antidepressant. Everybody's out there on the fake news. Um, however, the one area that I don't see um, that is really happening, it's probably the most important area, is in the area of health care. We need to be um, debunking the, the fake news that's out there because there are real life consequences to this. Um, this is different than some of the politics things that people are out to get, you know, different politicians and Trump. I mean, these are lives that are being impacted. And uh, I unfortunately know, as Peter said, I know firsthand what it's like. Um, I became, as I like to call myself, the, the accidental advocate. I never set out to do this work. Um, I, you know, 15 years ago, I had, I was living just my normal life. I'm, I have a career in advertising. I was married um, to my husband, Woody, here, uh, about to start to have a family. And all of that changed with one phone call. On August 6, 2003, I got a call from my dad telling me that my husband was dead. And I'm like, dead? What do you mean dead? He's, he's like, he's hanging. My husband um, died, um, he took his own life, he was hanging in the rafters of our garage, dead at age 37. Woody wasn't depressed. Woody didn't have a history of depression. Woody didn't have any mental illness. He had just started his dream job as vice president of sales with a startup company and was having trouble sleeping. So he went to his general practitioner, a family doctor that he has gone to for years and trusted. And, um, because he was, and he was given Zoloft, which is um, antidepressant, off-label for insomnia. We concluded, after having looked at this stuff, that there was no convincing trial evidence that Tamiflu affected influenza complications in treatment or influenza infections in prophylaxis, at exactly the same as the FDA a decade before. We also raised new questions about the drug's harms profile and the mode of action, also very important because the mode of action is tied to its harms. In addition, the review and the open correspondence, well, we made that available. The complete set of 107 trials is available on Dryad. We also published, the BMJ published all peer review comments from 2009 as well as all correspondence related to review, make it possibly the best documented and most transparent review ever undertaken, and certainly the first Cochrane review to use a full set of regulatory data. There are no publications in this review. We ditched publications altogether. There's been an exponential rise in the use of statins. It was originally um, recommended for people at high risk of cardiovascular disease. So that's people who've already had a heart attack or a stroke. And that's not really controversial. There, there seems to be consensus about this. But where opinions started to begin um, to be divided was that um, experts started saying, well, perhaps everybody over the age of 50 should be prescribed a statin. 
um, even if they don't have high cholesterol. We heard from um, paediatricians saying, well, maybe we should be screening children for high cholesterol so we can identify potential statin recipients. And Pfizer even marketed a chewable grape-flavoured statin so it would be more palatable for kids. Um, there was a very high-profile cardiologist in the UK that suggested that statins were so safe and effective that we should use them as condiments in burger outlets to counter the effects of a fast food meal. So when you grab your burger with your salt and your ketchup on the side, you grab a statin as well. We've even had debates about putting statins in the water supply. So how did we get from recommending medications to a group of high-risk individuals to now even debating about putting statins in the water supply? Your house is on fire. It started in the kitchen, it's moving to the living room, and the fire is advancing. The fire brigade and the fire engine arrives in front of your house. But they don't get out of the fire truck and you run up to the fire truck and you say, hurry, hurry, the house is on fire. And they said, wait, we have to negotiate first. <laughs> what materials are we going to use to put out the fire? <laughs> now, and as, as they're talking, the fire's going on. They said, how much, how much are you gonna pay us to put out the fire? But wait, the house is on fire. Are we going to use a material to put out the fire that then is going to have, it's going to be cancerogenic, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, then you're going to have to pay to clean it up at the whole time? So what do you say? Just whatever, whatever, we accept your conditions. Go in and put out the fire. They say, by the way, what's the name of your fire department? It's called Fire Department Merck. <laughs> and the big weapon they have is the inequality of arms, as lawyers say, be, the, the difference in the money you have to defend yourself and the money that a pharmaceutical company or an employer has to prosecute you. And also the slowness of the legal process helps those silenced whistleblowers because if you're held up in a, a, a legal case for several years, it's the whole of your life really for those years whereas a company can just delegate a couple of people to dealing with that and pay their lawyers to deal with it. So it's the length and the inequality of arms. This is about vaccines. And I think it's important to, to recognize that no routine vaccine was tested for overall effect on mortality in randomized trials before being introduced. I guess most of you think that we know what our vaccines are doing. We don't. The program we are talking about at the time, the vaccine program was introduced sort of in the late 70s after the success with the eradication of smallpox. WSO made sort of the first <coughs> immunization program for the low-income countries. And the program used initially was BCG for tuberculosis, an oral polio vaccine at birth, and then they got three doses of DTP, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, an oral polio vaccine, sort of three doses in the first month for life. And then you got <coughs> measles vaccine around nine months, and then booster dose of DTP and OPV. That has been the basic of the program. And now there are a lot more vaccines being introduced, and that's part of the problem we are going to talk about. <coughs> If you thought that public health was sort of a rational science, you should look at this curve. <clears throat> this is what has happened in the 40 years I have been in Guinea-Bissau. Mortality dropped 85%. That's a staggering reduction in under five mortality. 85%. I don't think that ever happened in human history. <clears throat> but it's not like a learning curve. If it had been a learning curve, it would have gone down sort of gradually like this. This is going down and up, uh, down and up. It is essentially saying we don't know what we are doing. It's very, very strange that people working with physics, people working with lots of other sciences, they have shared their data for decades. And who do not share their data? People who do health research. This is about our survival. I mean, whatever happened out in space billions of years ago is not equally important as surviving while we are here. And, and still we don't share our data. This, is, this just illustrates how rotten the whole system is.
We must share our data. And it would be hugely beneficial if we did that. So the Institute's primary area of work is healthcare, but it's not the only area of work. We will try to be comprehensive. Although we can't cover everything, we can learn from other people and they can learn from us. Mm -hmm.